things that I work on. I have my own company, so I have three proposal managers, I have one proposal coordinator, I have a graphics designer, and I have three technical writers that work part-time for my company. Um, oh, I have cards. Okay. <laughs> so, one of the questions that I got was, how did you get into this job? Okay, so I totally fell into it. Most people in our industry fall into proposal management. There isn't a track to get into proposal management. It, there's not a class in it. There used to be. There used to be. Uh, there's not a degree in it. My bachelor's degree is in history. My master's is in behavioral science. So I use the, I learned how to write in my degree, portion of my degree, um, behavioral science, maybe managing people a little bit, but I wouldn't say it's a, definitely not a one-on-one -on -one correlation to what I got my degree in to what I do on a daily basis. So I fell into it from pricing and then accounting into the business development department for a government contractor and then that led to working on their proposals within the business development department for a government contractor. So I normally work with marketing departments, business development departments. Also, since I am independent, I work with, all of my clients are small businesses. So anywhere between two million in revenue to 30 million in revenue. Normally by the time they get to 30 million in revenue, they've grown enough that they bring in their own proposal staff. So I'm basically the kickstart to we can't really afford to have our own person, but we need to get these proposals out the door, and that's what I do. So if I've done my job, they've grown so much they don't need me anymore. And that's good. I've done my job. I might you know, lose a lot of work for the client, but at the end of the day, it's a win-win. Okay, so my clients, um, so like I said, my clients do business with the federal government. They're also all over the world. I have clients here in Texas. I also have clients in Guam. So I've got clients in all different time zones, which means I work in all different time zones, uh, which is a little crazy. I also have people that work for me virtually in different time zones. So my VP is in Seattle. So I get up in the morning and I'm working for four hours before she logs in. So she logs into Slack in the morning and she's got like 100 emails messages for me. Um, that's just the joys and benefits of working in different time zones. <laughs> Uh, my clients are, so they're spread out around the world, but they also do a variety of different services. So when I'm doing technical writing for them, I could be writing an IT proposal one day, the very next day I could be writing interpretation, and the day after that I could be writing grounds maintenance. So their services vary extensively just depending on what their industry is. So what's unique about federal proposals versus commercial proposals is that when you're doing business with the federal government, I'm not an expert in IT, I'm not an expert in grounds maintenance, um, I'm becoming more of an expert in those fields because I have to be able to read the material that my client gives me and interpret it. What I specialize in is reading the solicitations that the government puts out. And what I equate it to is learning how to read a foreign language, right? Because you'll get this section L, which is the government's requirements, and you'll get the section M, which is how they're going to evaluate the product, that, the proposal that we put together, the writing that we put together. And what I specialize is in is interpreting the crazy language that they put in these solicitations and giving the government back a product that is compliant, is complete, and will win. So that's my goal. It's a little bit different than the commercial side, which Neil is going to talk about. Okay, I think that gives me a good basis. Does anybody have any questions about what I do? Yes, ma'am. Um, so in the chapter that we learned this week, we were talking about um, fact checking and making sure that your documentation is correct. So you said that you're not an expert in all this. How do you do it? So um, that's a really good question. So we do compliance checks. What we are checking for compliance wise is we read the government's requirement and we read what we've written and we look for keywords to make sure the keywords are there. We look to make sure it's, a, it's fully addressed. Um, you know, so if they say, you've got to cut the grass to one to three inches, well, we know enough to do a compliance check to see that our client wrote, yeah, we're gonna cut the grass to one to three inches long. This is how much it's gonna cost you. So we call it a compliance check, but I tell my clients, I'm not an expert in what you do. You have to give us the material that we're going to write for you. We're gonna make it beautiful 
but you've got to tell us. We can't tell the government how you're going to cut the grass. You have to tell us how you're going to cut the grass, but we're going to make sure that what you're saying is what they're asking. challenges between you and some of your clients in particular? <laughs> okay, where do I start? Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, um, so me, okay, where do I start? Okay, so we, we, we work on a lot of proposals at a time. Sometimes my team is working on 14 different proposals. Sometimes we're working on three. Uh, we use Asana, if you guys are familiar with Asana, project management tool online. Okay, so we use Asana to map out the deadlines, the internal deadlines. So, so we get this from the government on April 1st. It's due April 30th. The government doesn't care. If you don't turn it in April 30th, at, if you turn it in at 12 on one and it was due at 12, they're gonna throw it out. They're never even gonna read it. So your client has just spent you know, $15,000 on this proposal, $50,000, $150,000 writing this one document that the government's not even gonna look at. They're just gonna throw it in the trash. So one of the challenges that we have with our clients is, hey, we're sending this out for review. The first review is on this Friday. You need to give us the material on Tuesday so we can put it into the template. And a lot of what I do is document control, document formatting, writing. So we're writing it. We're making it beautiful. We're sending it back out to them to review. It's part of our review cycle. And they're missing their Tuesday deadline, which means we're asking them for it on Wednesday. Where is it on Wednesday? Oh, we'll get it to you on Thursday. Okay. Well, not only have they pushed... We, can't, we no longer have time to get ready for the Friday review. They've also not taken into account the fact that we have 13 other proposals that we're working on. So if you've missed your review deadline, I'm now pushing another client's project, which is just impor as important as theirs, to next week, or I'm working on Saturday. So that's one big challenge. Um, I think that's pretty universal for our field. So it's not, that's not just a, I'm an independent proposal challenge. That's a proposal manager, any industry that you work in challenge. Would you agree? When you're asking other people to meet deadlines that they're not meeting because they don't understand the importance of meeting those deadlines. Or they have a full-time job yes. and they're trying to do this on time. So yeah, so I was, um, actually Monday, Tuesday, I was on site with a client in Florida and this was one of the things that we were talking about exactly that. They've got, they don't have a proposal manager in, in house, right? So they've got project managers writing their proposals in their spare time. Well, for one, they're not experts in what we do. They're experts in what they do. They're not experts in putting out a proposal. So you're asking them to somehow within their work day produce something different than what is part of their normal work assignment and within a very specific deadline that doesn't necessarily match up to what they had planned when they got up that morning. So in that uh, example, like how would you navigate through that? What do you tell your clients? So a lot of a lot of that navigation is has to come from the top. Mm -hmm. It has to start at the sea level. When I work with small clients, so I work with C-level people. Uh, the C-levels that are then assigning people within their own industry corporation to <coughs> meet those deadlines, they have to convey to their people how important it is. As an outsider, even, even if you're a proposal manager in-house, if you're the in-house proposal manager, you still need that C-level buy-in, right? Because if you're, not, if you're not winning business, you're not growing, you're dying especially in government contracting. Well, in everything, right? If your business isn't growing, if you're not gaining new business, so those C-level people have to tell their people, hey, this is really important. This is a $100 million bid and we've got to win it because if we don't win it, these 35 people that are on this contract right now aren't gonna have a job in six months. So we had that, um, the proposal that I finished up this Monday morning, what is today, Tuesday? Did I just do that yesterday? <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, so the proposal I just finished yesterday morning for the FBI was exactly that situation. It was the C-level people sending out email after email after email. They're like, hey, we really need you to give Sonia this write-up. She has to have this one-page description of what you do for your project because a year from now, the FBI, we're gonna lose this work. That's 35 people that are gonna be out of work. So, C-level buy-in. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's and that's one of the really cool things. I mean, I told my daughter this. So, you know, it doesn't sound like what I do is really gram glamorous, but I create jobs for people, right? So we were. Um, but this is my daughter Maddie. Maddie and I were in Nashville. May, June, July, July. <laughs> oh, was it July? Yes, it was. Okay, in July. We were in we were in Nashville in July, and we were flying back in the Nashville airport. And we had visited with my client in Nashville while we were there, and we're flying back into the Nashville airport. And I'm going, hey, Maddie, Maddie, look, look, look at the security guards. Look at the badge that they have on their arm. I made that badge. I got them that job because my client has the security services contract for the Nashville airport. So if you're ever in Nashville, Archangel Protective Services is my client. Their their badge that's you know. So those are people standing there doing their job, saying, hi, how are you doing? Helping us walk across the street. I won that contract. That's cool. It's really cool. It's really cool. I had a client, I'll tell you another story. I had a client, I have a client, Guam. Awesome client. Uh, it's a family owned business that does grounds maintenance. They're my grounds maintenance client. And when I started working for them eight years ago, they had a big grounds maintenance contract. All of the Navy bases on Guam. So every naval base on Guam, they cut the grass. Fingers crossed, we just bid on it again. Um, the owner of the company, his name is Bob, he told me, he said, hey, if we win this contract, I can get my sons to come back from the States and work in my company. And we won. And it's like one of the biggest contracts on Guam. And we won it, and his son, since then, has moved back to Guam and is working in the company business. And we just bid on that contract again, actually, with his son's company that he started. So it's, you know, it's, it's not always glamorous, but sometimes it's really cool. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, what kind of programs or software do you use to write all your proposals? And like, what would you recommend us to have experience in? Good question. There's two. I would say there's two primary softwares. I work in the federal space, so I only use Microsoft Word. Uh, the reason for that is that my clients, as small businesses, don't know how to use InDesign, which would be the other choice. Um, so I need to be able to send them a draft have them mark it up and send it back to me. If I try to send them a final version for their records in InDesign, they're gonna be like, we can't open this file, we don't wanna use it. InDesign is popular in proposal management, so, but I've just found over the years that I've become an expert, an expert in Microsoft Word. I'm about as good as I, I feel like I can get. I've learned a lot of tips and tricks, but InDesign is also a good one. And that, so those would be the, the main softwares that we use for the everyday production of the documents. But um, I'm also, within my company, I'm really tech um, positive, so I buy a lot of tech. We use Asana, we use Slack, we use the time tracking, I use QuickBooks. Um, I also subscribe to um, a software called GovWin that tracks um, federal opportunities that are coming up. Um, I just invested in an LMS, a learning management system for my team. It's called System Hub, where I am um, publishing on System Hub policies and procedures for our company, as well as training videos. So when, so one thing that we do really often, as an example, is we format resumes. Worst job in proposals ever. Formatting resumes is incredibly boring. Sometimes you have to do 50 of them. It's awful, awful. Uh, but I wrote a procedure for, hey, this is how we format resumes, and it goes into the table, and here's the tricks for making it beautiful, making sure all the bullet points line up, everything that you want to, to make it perfect so that readers aren't drawn to the mistakes that are in your resumes, they're just drawn to the actual. So I wrote a procedure, um, filmed a video of me formatting a resume. Yay. A lot of fun. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, you said you have your own business, right? I do. Uh, so what made you start your own business and what was the process of that? That's a good story. Um, uh, so I was working for a government contractor and um, I'll just to make the story short, um, it didn't work out. <laughs> so I kind of got thrown into going independent, but once I did, I realized that for what I wanted to do and manage my own time and work from home and be able to be there for my daughter's school activities, definitely working from home and owning my own business was the way to go. It's not, 
it's it's different. It's not for everyone. Uh, part of the process is I've been independent. I've had my own company for ten years. I've kind of gotten out of some of what I love, right? Because I don't get to do the proposals every day. Now I'm watching other people do the proposals, and all I get to do is review them. So I'm kind of out of what is kind of weirdly, oddly exciting about what we do. You know, when you first get the solicitation and your client sends it to you and you open it up and you read through L&M and you're like, oh, what crazy stuff is the government going to make me write to today? I'm missing on some of that because now I'm a manager. So. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, how many members are part of your team? So I have, there's five of us full-time and then three part-time technical writers. And we really probably need more workers. We're a little bit short. I've got 14 clients, and we usually, I'd say, I'd say our average is about 10 proposals at a time. But some of those are small. Some of those are, you know, 20 pagers that we submit in about four days. Not ideal, but. Oh, this is like starting up your business and everything. Did you initially like want to work with the FBI, or how did they all get involved? So my clients work with the FBI. So it's really uh, my industry has grown. My client, as my client base has grown. Um, the the, in, the 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 agencies that I've worked with has grown, um, so it just I I have a website, but I don't think anybody ever finds me through my website. I'm 100% referral. So I do a lot of, but it's we do we do federal work across all kinds of agencies. We do have um, top secret projects that we work on as well. So get the clearance, really fun. <laughs> That's another real, that's the federal side. If you work federal, you know, if you're, you might need a clearance for some of the stuff you should do. Yes? Um, how did you acquire clients for your business? 100% referral. I started out with one. Um, I started out with some contacts of people that I had worked with in the two previous government contractors that I have, and it's still 100% referral. Um, I pick them up from other clients along the way. And, and also, I will say, I do fire clients. There's been a couple over the years that have not been good fits for um, the way we do things. Like, I'm OK with working weekends. Like, I worked last weekend. <coughs> I worked last weekend. Yeah, or last weekend. But I don't want to work last weekend because my client was put me in a situation to work over the weekend consistently. So if there's clients that just consistently can't meet deadlines or aren't giving me what I ask for timely or are giving me a hard time, we'll fire them. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Neil, and I would just like to say I'm really glad I went first because Neil wrote a book. So <laughs> I can't really compare to that. Hi. You did a great job. I'm Neil Cobb. I used to teach here. I taught here for three years after I did this retired thing. So I've retired <laughs> twice. That's why I look like this, and she looks like that. So uh, once you retire, once you've been a proposal person, you can retire early. That's what I did. I, uh, I had a very good career at AT&T. You've probably heard of the big phone company. But I worked for it when it was Ma Bell, which was really big, and then it, I worked for it when it was not so big. I was part of the regional telephone company, Southwestern Bell, excuse me. And um, then I went back to work for AT&T. Then I went back to work for Southwestern Bell. And then I worked for SBC. And then we bought AT&T. <laughs> so I ended up working in the same company for 35 years. That's really weird. People don't do that anymore. I was an executive there. I was the head of the proposal center. We called it the Knowledge and Proposal Management Center. And if my, when I took uh, that job, we lost 50% of our people to downsizing. And when I left it, I had grown it to twice that size again. So at one time, how many people do we have with working for you? Eight. I had 130 <laughs> proposal <laughs> people. Technical writers, illustrators, programmers, project managers, and 
proposal leaders, managers, people who would go in and do exactly what Sonia did. And at one time I had almost 50 of those, and then the rest of the people were writing content so we could repurpose that content. And I guess the most important thing I did as an executive in the proposal business was we went from working overtime and weekends and all-nighters when I first started to nobody worked any overtime or all-nighters when I left because we were able to build automated systems and build content repositories that we could repurpose the content quickly and then get that content um, into the hands of the, the writers and the experts who could then customize it for every um, client that we had. Our clients, I had federal government clients, but I also worked in the commercial side of things. I had state government clients. And so we supported every salesperson at AT&T with either a full custom response to a request for proposal or RFD, <coughs> or an unsolicited proposal, which would be uh, more of a, a, a sales tool for uh, avoiding competition. RFPs were always highly competitive. I think you've learned that from your reading from Sonia. Uh, but then we also were able to become part of a marketing organization where we actually ran the marketing communications uh, website inside the company. So every piece of content we wrote, we wrote it so it could be uh, used as a marketing uh, material or as proposal material, and then we would customize it as need be for whatever our end client would, uh, was needing. Uh, what were the questions? Current job title? Well, I had three job titles in, in my technical writing career. I was a proposal developer, I was a content director, and then I became the executive director of that organization. Uh, you know my company, Big Telecom. Uh, my, I, I reported to vice presidents when I had my uh, executive job. And so there were maybe one or two people between me and the head of the company. Um, we did all of the sales proposals, like I said, for the mom and pop uh, organizations, which would be anything from uh, a million dollars uh, of value to, I think you said 30, that was probably our mid-range business. Uh, we also did billion dollar deals. So we worked the highest end in both federal government, state government, and uh, local companies, and international companies at some point too. Uh, I, was all, I was in a lot of different departments, marketing, sales support, and sales proper. And I must say, if you have a proposal job, the best place to be is with salespeople because they fire those people last. <laughs> so if we're part of the sales team and we integrate with the sales team, we had a lot more job security. Um, what would you like to hear about as far as a typical day at work? Uh, as an executive, I was one way. As a proposal developer, I was a totally different, uh, had a totally different role. What, what's more important? Yeah. Um, how, how did you handle editing? Like, did that? Editing, I had a chief editor. He was a graduate of the technical writing department here in North Texas. He uh, got his master's degree here, like I did, uh, and in fact, I, I probably over the years hired 20 to 30 graduates of the program. Uh, he was my head editor. We had different layers of editors. All of our proposal writers were also editors, so we would bring an editor into every um, proposal project and then my head editor would usually ensure that they had followed all of our uh, uh, style requirements and, and uh, of course, grammatical and all the other writing requirements. Yeah? So, 
So what would, I guess, be like the documentation-wise, the difference between a proposal that's like a million dollars versus a billion? Okay, I got a great story. <laughs> I did a proposal for the state of California. Anybody from California? They had a telecommunications system there, and it supported every agency within the state of California. And when they bid it out, and this we did this probably in 2010, when they bid it out, it was worth 1.2 billion dollars. Okay, I uh, I had a guy who ran that uh, uh, proposal, uh, a team behind him. We had a team of probably 200 technical experts that we were taking information from and working all that and it was a huge deal. Once again, if we lost that bid, almost a hundred people would lose their jobs in one day. We have no business, right? We had to deliver, this was back in the paper delivery days when we used to print all of our proposals. You still print proposals? Every once in a while. Every now and then. Well, California don't believe it when they say they're really conscious about the ecology because they made us each proposal and we had to have, I want to say, 15 copies, weighed 74 pounds. Each proposal for that billion dollar business. We delivered it in a van and we had to forklift all of these packages. They had to all be separate and we had to deliver them to Sacramento at, at that deadline. If we had missed the deadline, if that van had broken down by the side of the road, we would have been in trouble. But uh, 70, 74 pounds each, five binders, five inches plus um, associated material. So that's the biggest I think we ever did. Uh, now, uh, you might do a 20-page proposal. We had an automated proposal generator that we created to use that content in our databases. And a salesperson could whip out a proposal in about 15 minutes. It sounded totally custom for their company that they were uh, writing it for. And it might be anywhere from three to 15 pages. Big spread for us. That's why we automated so much. My team would do approximately 2,400 major RFPs, which were the multi-volume, you know, up to that five, you know, the 74 pounder, but uh, they might be a single volume up to five volumes, whatever it might be. We did 2,400 of those a year, but we did 70,000 automated and smaller proposals. Okay, wow. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, of the three positions that you said you've been in, what are the differences okay. in the work day? Oh, the work day, if I was a proposal manager, mm -hmm. I, I would get my assignment, and that might be an unsolicited proposal where I get to be very creative, or it might be an RFP, like Sonia was talking about, where I had to follow whatever they gave us. I had to make sure that we met every specification. So I'd have to analyze the opportunity. I would then get immediately with my sales lead and say, what's your strategy? What are you trying to accomplish here? Who's going to be on our team? And I had to build that team. And then I'd have to kick off the project. So if it was an unsolicited proposal, I would have them in a room like this and we would storyboard the entire thing on the wall. If it was an RFP, we already had our structure because they gave it to us, right? Well, what I'd have to do is go through and pick out all those requirements, find out, you know, if they say you have to use a little heart above every time you do an eye, <laughs> then we better do it because if they saw one eye that didn't have that heart, we were disqualified. So I would read front to back a couple of times, then we'd strip that content out and we put it in our database. Now, towards the end of my career, we had a team in India. And what we would do, we'd have a, a small group that would take that electronic RFP and we'd put it uh, in a staging area. Uh, we'd go home at 5 o'clock. They'd come to work about 6 o'clock our time. And they would come in and they would put that into our database and they would 
break every question out and then they go into our knowledge base and they would answer as many of those questions as they could. Overnight, the next morning I come in and most days 85 to 95 percent of the bid had been responded to. But then my job became to customize it. So I would get that material, have my, my team of experts and we'd review it, we'd work iteratively to make sure that we had the best right answer that we could for the particular customer that we were giving the RFP response to. Then I made sure we had reviews. You have to review uh, proposals. You have to get independent reviewers. So I would go get directors from uh, the finance department. I'd go get directors from the IT department. Whoever I thought could come in and understand what we were offering and provide unbiased, objective criticism for that. And they would spend sometimes, in the case of the 74 pounder, five days reviewing all that. So I had to build that schedule that would allow us to do that. And then I had to manage all those executives because guess what? They didn't want to be there for five days. They, they had jobs, right? So I had to find a way to get the most out of them and whoever they had assigned to doing the technical reviews, the management reviews, the writing reviews. All that had to be done and managed by me if I was a proposal developer. Okay? And then I had to make sure we published it, however, met the specifications of the deal. So if it was paper, I did paper. But by the way, California wouldn't let us do duplex. It had to be single side. That was the other thing. That's another reason why it's like 75 pounds. Uh, but I was responsible for that job. And so I had to go through every page and make sure it passed, finalized, we called it. We had to finalize the bid, and we would go through. And if we had a bad page, rip it out and redo it. Then we had to pack it up and ship it wherever it needed to go. Electronic bids made it a whole lot easier. By the time I left the business, uh, a lot of bids were handled online. They were almost like eBay where you would put your bid up against somebody else's bid and they just go through and evaluate. It'd be in real time. We had to supply answers in real time and then supply a, a, a price and they would uh, evaluate and we'd know by the end of the day if we made it or not. And that was the proposal developer. And I'll tell you, as an executive, I did one thing every day. I tried to think what we'd be doing five years from now. And that's why we had the systems that we had when I left. We had automated proposal generators. We had knowledge bases. We had um, uh, vendor requirements and um, questionnaire response systems. We, we, we could automate just almost everything about our jobs except the one thing that a machine couldn't do. And that was right. Technical writers were the foundation of my business. They still are. Without a technical communicator, we couldn't win. We couldn't explain. I'll give you one example. Another California bid. This was for the Los Angeles Unified School District. Eleven companies bid on the same RFP that we were bidding on. And about a week before we turned it in, I got a frantic call from my client. She was the sales exec for that uh, industry in, in Los Angeles. And she said, all my engineers are saying you've dumbed down all my material. They said you've taken their wonderful engineering speak and turned it into common English. And they say we're going to get laughed out of the bed if we don't let them have their way. I said, well, I beg to differ. She'd never worked with us before. And so she said, what can we do? I said, get them on the phone. So we had a conference call. They had 15 of their engineers, her and me, on the phone. And I had, they had the material in front of them. And I said, you guys don't really think we wrote your material the way it, it needs to go to your customer. I want you to go line by line with me, and you tell me where I have changed any meaning in your material. 
we went through about a paragraph and a half before they said, well, yeah, it's all clear, but we're still going to lose because it's not technical enough. I said, let's, let's wait and see. If I'm wrong, you can tell your bosses and they can come have my head. I don't care. We bid. She was nervous. About a week later, they evaluated all these bids. And I get a phone call from her. And she's jumping up and down. She said, we won. We won this deal. I said, well, yeah, I had a feeling. We won. <laughs> and she said, how? I, I, I just can't get over how you did that. I said, what, what was the review? What did they say? She said, 11 companies bid, and basically they all offered exactly the same thing. There was only one difference in all the 11 players. They could understand ours. I never got a call from the engineers. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. But she was ecstatic. And we never had another problem with good technical communication, good tech writers providing the material in such a way that the decision makers could understand. What you do is the most important part of a proposal. You write it. Okay? Sonia writes proposals. Now she reviews what her proposal writers write. I wrote proposals, and then I would review what our proposal writers wrote. And the single thing that distinguished our proposals from any other, yeah, they all look pretty, they all had bullet lists, and they all had illustrations, you could read them and an executive decision maker could understand what we were offering, how much it cost, and what the value was to that business, not all the bells and whistles. That made no difference whatsoever. And the only way to do that is to write it that way. So, write. Any questions? My work is done. <laughs> Thank you so much. No questions? Thank you. All right. Thanks for having us. Oh, you said you had a book right or something?